This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us from remote locations around the world, and also new listeners in Florida, Colorado, and Utah. Thank you for being with us. My guest today is antivirus software pioneer and founder of McAfee Software, Mr. John McAfee. He has over 4 million viewers on YouTube. And he's become somewhat of a technology anti-hero during this past year. Uh, In just a moment, he'll be joining us to set the record straight and, more importantly, give us a peek into what's ahead. But before we get today's program rolling, in the interest of full disclosure, which is what you get each and every week on the Costa Report, I want to let our listeners know that John McAfee and I worked together early in our careers in Silicon Valley. In 1983, we were executives for the first optical storage company, Omex Corporation. Mr. McAfee was in charge of engineering, and I headed up product marketing. And during that time, we had a respectful and cordial working relationship. Though (laughs) recently, I was surprised to hear him admit in his interview with Wired Magazine that he'd been dealing and consuming large amounts of cocaine while we worked together. I I admit that uh, I was a bit square then, and, and I remain so to this day. And so uh, these kinds of things frequently just go right over my head. But that said, even operating at half power, McAfee proved to be a remarkable engineer and a forward thinker. Today, Mr. McAfee is completely drug-free, and we're going to learn more about where this unconventional genius is taking us next. But before he joins the program, let me mention that McAfee was born in the United Kingdom, and he spent his childhood in Salem, Virginia. He received his degree in mathematics from Roanoke College and he worked as a programmer for NASA, UNIVAC, and later Xerox, Computer Sciences Corporation, and also Lockheed. In 1987, he founded McAfee & Associates, which operated out of his modest home in Santa Clara, and the rest is a matter of public record. The company went public and was acquired. McAfee eventually retired to a quiet oceanfront home in Belize, where he made investments and he dabbled in startups, and in 2010, he began a new venture, in antibiotics based on anti-quorum sensing technology. And life was simple and good until the spring of 2012, when his home was raided on the basis of false drug trafficking charges, and shortly thereafter, McAfee's neighbor was found murdered, and he became an in- a person of interest. Fearing for his life, McAfee fled to Guatemala, where he was arrested for illegally entering the country and faced deportation back to Belize, But due to legal delays and several medical emergencies, the Guatemalan government deported him back to the United States. Since arriving safely on the mainland, McAfee has been tearing up the Internet with videos that spoof images of him as some gun-toting, bath-salt-smelling, Hugh Hefner-style showman. And while his life and public image may appear to be over the top, behind all of these shenanigans lies a deliberate and methodical inventor. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program a technology pioneer, thinker, and former colleague, Mr. John McAfee. Nice to speak with you, John. Well, it's very nice to speak to you, and and you're right. My my face and ears are are red with such uh, glowing praise, and it's the first such praise I've heard in in many years. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm really happy to be here today. Well, I happen to know a little bit about your background, and I think that the press focuses too much on the flamboyant rumors and less on the substance, and that's part of the problem that we have in the media today. You know, I've been thinking a lot about how to spend our time together, and and here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to treat you like you're some spectacle, the way I see other programs exploit you, and I don't want to go over the same ground over and over again. So I decided I'm only going to ask you one question about the situation of Belize, and then we're all done. We're going to move on. So here's my question. Has there been any progress made in finding the person who murdered your neighbor? Uh, absolutely none, uh, at least not to my knowledge. Um, many uh, news agencies have gone to the Belizean authorities um, ask what the status is, and specifically in relation to me. The authorities continue to insist that there is no evidence whatsoever linking me to the murder of my neighbor, but merely want to question me. 
the questioning again is 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 a ruse of in beliefs they can hold you for questioning for sixty sixty days without charges, and if they're unsatisfied at the end of sixty days, can renew it for another sixty days indefinitely. Um, the Belizean government, it is certainly no secret, wants me to stop mouthing off about the corruption and danger in Belize because it has significantly harmed the tourist industry. Uh, and they would like nothing better than to put me away in a, in a quiet cell somewhere in the interior and let me uh, rot away in silence. So uh, I have no intention of, of ending up that way. Now, I just want to make it po- uh, the point that you have repeatedly offered to answer any questions that they have by telephone telephone, by Skype, or to meet them in person in a neutral country, including right. here in America, uh, in, in England, uh, the Bahamas, uh, many countries I've offered to meet them in, and they have declined. They want me to come there. Well, I, I, that's absolutely right, and I want to make it clear that you've been fully cooperative, and they haven't taken you up on it, so therein already is a problem. You might remember that I lived in Laos during the Vietnam War, and so I'm going to be the first to say that if you're living in a country where there's corruption and you get sideways with the law, you better get the heck out of Dodge, because there's no winning. They'll put you in the ground before they let you ruin their party, and that's what you did. You, you left the only way you could— and I think that that's pretty much all there is to the story. Or am I missing something? No, I mean, and in, in certainly from my perspective, that's that's all there is to the story. Although it's a it's a very big story. You know, from my perspective, I, I felt the entire time that my life was in danger, or, or at least uh, you know my future. You know, the living in a jail cell uh, indefinitely is is not much of a life. So, well, let me go further and say your life is still in danger. Uh, well, I would I would have to agree with that fully. The uh, only because I have not yet shut up about police. I can't help it when you know when when people ask me questions, which you know they bring it up. I, I have to tell the truth that well, it is a very corrupt country, uh, extremely corrupt, extremely dra- dangerous. On a per capita basis, it's the murder capital of the world. Um, it is a tiny banana republic in Central America with no real laws. Um, and other than the law of the party in charge. Um, and I, I continue to say that. That continues to hurt their tourism, and it continues to to create ire in, on the part of the government. So, you know, it's not beyond reason for them to try to reach out and touch me, uh, so to speak, no matter where I am. Well, you know that they're running a major ad campaign all over the airwaves now, uh-huh. right, in order to offset the damage that they allege that you've done to their tourism business. That, that's correct. In fact, whenever I travel by airplane, every single magazine uh, in, <laughs> in the seat back and front has come to police. I never saw that before. No one had ever heard of it. I have uh, never seen right. it either. I have to tell you, nobody, nobody I've seen, I know of, has ever seen a campaign like this from Belize. So they they know that you're not going to be quiet, and you have every right not to be. So let me ask you real quickly this this YouTube that went uh, video that went wild here. Uh, did did you shoot that and release that before you left Belize or after? No, I shot it after I left Belize. Um, the press was making such uh, such hay over my image. Um, and, you know, universally, you know, calling me a nutcase, uh, bonkers, paranoid, um, you know, uh, and addicted to bath salts and on and on and on. I thought, well, you know, if that is in fact the image that I have to carry, well, well let's, let's just put it out there in its extremity. And so, okay, if I'm a nutcase, then I'm going to act like a nut. And if I'm paranoid, I'm going to do a paranoid rant. Um, if I'm going to be doing bath salts, well, let me, you know, plant my entire face in it and so and and that's all i did just to to make fun of the image that they had made of me i have to tell you when i saw the video i i couldn't stop laughing because it was vintage you right i mean if you're gonna if you're gonna make false accusations and i'm just gonna i'm gonna take it and i'm gonna exaggerate it and have a whole lot of fun with it and uh Boy, I, I think you really pulled it off well, and everybody got a big kick out of it. And, and of course, the YouTube uh, video went viral. Uh, more than 4 million people have seen it. And we have to take our first commercial break. When we come back, let's find out what John McAfee has in store for his next act. You're listening to The Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. 
Are you looking for ideas to create a more balanced meal plan? As one of the world's largest providers of fresh fruits and vegetables, Dole makes it easy to eat the right foods. From a wide variety of salad blends and all-natural salad kits to fresh-cut vegetables and a rainbow of your favorite fresh fruit, Dole delivers good nutrition naturally. But Dole goes beyond just offering healthy fruits and vegetables. Dole has their own nutrition institute that gives you the knowledge and tools you need to make smart choices about your nutrition and health. Visit www.dole.com for more information about the Dole Nutrition Institute. Be sure to sign up for their e-newsletter to receive delicious recipes, tips, and articles to help you make your meals the best they can be. Visit www.dole.com. For more. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Now, everyone knows that my favorite is your Pinot Noir, but Caraccioli's known for a lot more than that. It's really the bubbles that kind of differentiates what we're doing in the area as opposed to a lot of our peers. And the way that we looked at it was there's great Chardonnay and Pinot Noir fruit in the Santa Lucia Highlands in the greater Monterey County. And we wanted to be able to utilize those grapes and showcase them in a little bit different light. And to do that comes a little bit of a laborious process in terms of making sparkling wine and doing A little it. bit? A lot of it, <laughs> but still definitely worth the trouble and worth the wait. Um, we're currently selling 2006 and 2007 sparkling wines in the beginning of 2013. So it kind of tells you the time invested as well as all of the different techniques that we use and Michelle implements to ensure that we're delivering a quality product. Thank you for being with us again, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. I used to dread getting up and going to work. I was done with the corporate grind. I was tired of being a starving artist. And I started looking around for a business that I believed in, and I kind of wanted to do something a little more green. My score mentor helped me take the first step. He helped me create a business plan and helped me implement it. They really taught me how to think big. Score helped me to make the unimaginable possible all for free. I'm here because of Score. I'm here because of Score. Get your free business mentor at score.org. The 1,200,000 women and men of Rotary have accomplished extraordinary things. They've taught people to read, worked toward world peace, and have nearly eradicated a crippling disease. But each of them know they could accomplish so much more if only they were 1,200,000 and one. Learn more at rotary.org. There's just one place where students are students first and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. There's just one place where a team is more than a group of individual agendas. It's a catalyst for demonstrating the potential of the collaborative spirit. There's just one place where players, coaches, and fans experience the exhilaration that happens when an entire community rallies behind the school team. That place is your local high school. High school sports offer more than the joy of competition. Studies show that student-athletes are more likely to enjoy greater levels of achievement in other areas of their lives, including academics. In addition, high school sports help young people in California develop the discipline and confidence they need to be leaders in life, even as they unite communities like nothing else. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Take a moment to see Rebecca's video pick of the week. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Rebecca Costa YouTube channel. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest is antivirus pioneer John McAfee. And before the break, we were talking about the difference between the public image that you have and the truth of your situation and how the YouTube video was a, an attempt to make fun at how ridiculous these characterizations with. And as I mentioned, it, you have millions of YouTube viewers and a, a book being written about you. And I understand they're also making a movie about your life. Uh, but I know that you are an inventor at heart and once an inventor, always an inventor. So what are you working on right now? Well, you know, uh, up until recently, I, I thought I would never be able to uh, work on any uh, invention or any technology again. The uh, the image of 
of myself as a, a madman, lunatic, paranoid, uh, uh, whatever, a drug-addled person would, would make uh, the, it a marketing nightmare to try and sell whatever I had developed. However, it is something something odd about about uh, people in general. I think uh, we we don't give people enough credit for being able to see through things. Uh, you know, at some point back in in June, uh, I was watching uh, myself and in interviews in the press, and um, they were finally you know ending up saying, "So that was that interview with McAfee. He certainly is a crazy fellow." And yet, you know, I was looking going, "I don't think I said anything crazy." <laughs> And then all the all the comments were the same way. I don't think he was crazy. He sounded very sane to me. And then four four weeks ago, the uh, uh, the um, uh, Info World Europe uh, did a survey. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Tech Week Europe did a survey of all of its thousands of users um, and uh, uh, asked who they would like to see replace Steve Ballmer as head of Microsoft. And lo and behold. Thousands of votes later, John McAfee beat out everybody. I was five points ahead of Bill Gates, um, and and that. So, have they called you? Has Microsoft called you yet? No, of course not. I mean, this is the this is the readers of. Well, what do you, What do you mean? Of course not. We we they just ran a focus group study. They did. Yeah, that's that's what that survey is. It's a look. Let's put it into marketing language. That was a focus group study, and they said we like Microsoft a lot better if you make McAfee the head of it. Right. Well, that's exactly what they said. Unfortunately, I went on, on CNBC the following day, and they said, what would your first move be? I said, I'd fire everybody. I mean, the, or most of the people, because it's, it's become stagnant. You know, the company is, uh, is uh, solidified and ossified. So I, I don't think, you know, having stated that, that they will ever call me and ask me. Uh, but but it, what it did. Well, uh, now I know you wouldn't fire everyone because you're too no, no. nice. Right, I would not, I, and and I was being facetious by and large. But I think it, it was a scary thing for for me to say to the Microsoft employees. I wouldn't. But but there are some people who really do need to be reassigned. You know, they you know uh, put into softer jobs that have less impact. And so let me say that. Well, that's right. It, you know, you've always been good at si- sort of creating a what we used to call a skunk works. Inside a large corporation, you were very good at putting together a small, like, Navy SEAL team and getting them working really hard and long hours on a, on a specific project. Right, and that, that's my fort. I'm, I'm, I'm capable of, of doing that, and I enjoy doing that. And I think the people that work with me on those projects are very highly motivated and, and love what they do. And the secret is, is learning how to do that within uh, a stagnant bureaucracy, and, and I, I do know how to do that. But the thing that shocked me was it just was so sudden. I'm going, whoa, what? The, the world really is crazy. You know, a month earlier, the entire press had said, this man is over the hill, he's lost it. And now, you know, the, the readers are going, we'd like to see McAfee in charge of Microsoft. Well, well quite frankly, I, I would be bored silly in, in that position in charge of Microsoft. Well, I have to say this. Uh, to me, the fact that that people voted you to be the head of Microsoft is a good sign because it means people aren't listening to all the junk on the media. They're using right. their brains and thinking for themselves, and that's a good thing. But I can't let you off the hook here. What are you working on next? Because you didn't answer my question, and you know I'm going to come not. back. You are going to come back. And so, <laughs> so what I'm working on is something I've been thinking about for, for a couple of years now, and that is – um, uh, we are losing, uh, as a society, at least from my own perspective, uh, a huge amount of our privacy and our security. And and to me, I, I think I think privacy is central to a sane society. Uh, in a society where everything that we think and do is known by everyone, everyone else, well, that's that's kind of scary. It's scary because we are not perfect humans. And, and no matter how benign our, our thoughts and actions may be, they will offend someone. This is certain. And, and so we are granted privacy so that when we close our doors, we can do the things that, that appeal to us, our hobbies. Uh, we can use the language that we prefer to use. We can, we can do things with our, our wives and our friends that, that maybe, you know, we, we just don't want the world to share. Not that we're doing anything wrong or anything we're ashamed of, just like, why should everybody know? Or maybe I'm developing something that I do not want my competitors to know. Privacy gives us the capacity to have our own identity in a safe environment. 
But Ooh. never before has it been so under assault. We even have uh, warrantless surveillance going on by the government. Yes, and, that, and that's a scary thing, because the government are the people we have voted in power uh, to, to, to give us a culture in which we can live. They're uh, supposed to protect our privacy. That, well, according to me, they are. They're supposed to protect lots of things they're not protecting. Um, and, and, and that frightens me, because without that, we, we're moving very slowly toward 1984. The, and so the, you're the, working or, on something that will assure our privacy. Well, it will help ensure it. I, nothing will, will guarantee it unless all of us come to the same conclusion. Uh, we will all have to, to stand up together at some point and say, look, I'm not taking any more of this. You know, I want to be able to close my door and let no one hear or, or watch, not because I'm doing something wrong, but because I like my individuality. And okay, I but it's one, thing, it's one thing that, you know, I can't imagine anybody listening to this interview today not nodding their head up and down and, and just ferociously agreeing with you. It's one thing to acknowledge the problem and to know how widespread and extensive it is and, and also how dangerous it is. But what, what do we have to solve that problem? Well, you know, on my part, I'm creating a technology that can help solve that problem. You know, I've developed a, um, a networking device that will, it has no screen. It's just a little box that uh, you charge up and drop in a pocket. It communicates with your cell phone or your iPad or um, or whatever tablet device you use or, or even your laptop. And it turns those devices into two things. It turns them into what they used to be, which is connecting up to the Internet whenever they want. Mm-hmm. And the other half of it is if you choose, you click one of the buttons on the app interface, and suddenly you're now in a completely private world. And that private world is the world that I have created through a localized, completely floating and, and uh, constantly in flux network where no one can see what you're doing because no one knows who you are. You could be wandering through the college campus, for example, and, and, and passing a file or, or receiving a file from someone. You, you have no clue who you got the file from. The person you got the file from has no clue even if someone had asked for that file. You have just merely placed a bunch of data in a public area available for anyone. Whoever gets it, there's no record and there is no ID. Wow, uh, and- so this is, this is something that is brand new. I'm going to say it gives anonymity over the Internet. And not only that, it's something that that desperately uh, every one of us who's using the internet, which is everybody, is going to need. We have to take another break, but we're going to come right back and find out more about this privacy technology because I think everybody needs to hear about this, and uh, we want to know some more. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data? And that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere, and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. It's pouring rain. It's real dark outside. Your heart starts beating really, really fast. You've never done anything so hard in your life. This is boot camp. This is the real thing now. It's such extreme pain, you don't understand how you can finish. I began to feel that there was no way I ever going to have my title, U.S. Marine. It takes special inner strength, courage, and desire to do this. I was just thinking, I'm so close. I'm so close. And when I I finished, I was like, I'm done. I did it. The moment I will never forget is when this drill instructor that I admire so much comes up to me straight in front of me, put her arm on my shoulder and said, good morning, Marine. PFC Summer Volkman became a Marine. Can you? Visit Marines.com or call 1-800-MARINES. The few, the proud, the Marines. 
Scorpion 23 traveling west on MSR Vernon. Four victors, 16 packs. Request MSR status over. Roger. Scorpion 23, all MSRs and AOR at past 24 hours. Three IEDs on MSR Vernon. <laughs> Always be casualties. And for our wounded warriors, coming home can sometimes be a battle in itself. American troops who suffer traumatic injuries need the support of every American. Join us and send your message of support to our wounded warriors and their families at USO.org. The USO, until everyone comes home. He worked out early practiced late, and studied well into the night. The next day, he did it all over again. She missed time hanging out and socializing with friends so she could make it on time to practices and games. He became a top student and a confident leader, even as he helped his team win back-to-back -back conference titles. She became a role model in her community, even as she led her team to an undefeated season. And when they finished playing high school sports, what did they do next? She graduated from college with honors and went to work for a successful company. He attended graduate school and became a difference maker in his community. Because that's what student athletes in California do. They use the skills they develop playing high school sports today to do even bigger things in life tomorrow. High school sports. A winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Grab your smartphone and follow us on Twitter. Twitter.com forward slash Rebecca Costa. Welcome back to the Costa Report. This is Rebecca Costa, and uh, my guest today is technology entrepreneur and a former colleague of mine, Mr. John McAfee. And before the break, you were describing your new venture designed to ensure our privacy on the Internet. So why hasn't anyone else developed this technology? I mean, when you think about it, it's it's a sure success, isn't it? Well, I think it's because, uh, Rebecca, we've been uh, uh, used to the Internet so long that we think in terms of what we know, that is, a vast, fast backbone that connects everyone in the world, which is marvelous, and we need that. Uh, but there are certain applications. For example, one of our applications is a, is uh, the equivalent of Craigslist, although it's a localized version. For example, imagine this. Here's how our application works. Uh, let's say you decide you want you want a Mustang convertible, mm -hmm. and so you pull up our our app, app and say I want a Mustang convertible, and it says uh, how far away, and it says well I'm only willing to walk two blocks, and it goes okay thank you, and then it goes back to sleep. Now, as you move around the city through the day, you go to work, you go to, to, to lunch or whatever, uh, chances are, uh, and, and by the way, on the other side, you have, someone says, I have a Mustang convertible, here's the photograph, just like on Craigslist, and then they sit back. Let's say I, I, I say, I'm only going to walk two city blocks, and I go to lunch, and suddenly I get an alert, an alarm. I look at my, my, my iPhone, and it says, okay, uh, two blocks from here is a Mustang convertible, here's the photograph, do you want to get a look at it? And you say yes or no. If you say yes, it says make a right here and, and walk uh, 30 seconds down the street. So it localizes the things that need to be localized. For example, if I'm on Craigslist, I want a Mustang. I have to first of all put my state, my city, and then spend all day calling people or emailing people. There's no contact between a person here until I get the alert. And I say, yes, I want to see this. At that point, the other person is contacted saying, someone wants to come look at the car in, in two minutes. Are you around? Can they see it? Mm -hmm. And if so, you just walk over, you look at it, and you say yes or no. The same thing with everything you might use on Craigslist. It makes it makes the task of finding something mindless. You just type in what you want, and you wait until the system finds it for you. You go look at it. If you don't like it, you say no, and then it waits till you come close to another item. Now, more importantly, this entire transaction you described around the Mustang is private. No one else Absolutely. knows I'm doing this. Absolutely. They don't know where I'm going or what I'm Absolutely doing. Absolutely not. Not until you agree that you want to buy the thing, and then the person has to identify themselves, and you identify them to them. But nobody else. It's just you. It's nobody else's business. 
Right. Well, I think a lot of us feel that way, John. It's none of anybody else's business. And I don't want, look, I, I'm not doing anything wrong. But that just the idea that someone's looking in on me creeps me out. And that's just enough for me. Well, it should creep you out because here's the question. Why does someone want to look in on you? Is it because they don't have a life themselves? Because they're trying to catch you doing something? Because they don't like you? And, can and, and can I tell you something? It's the same well, reason I have drapes. Of course. I'm not walking around my house naked. Of course not. But I, but I don't want people looking in my windows. I, to me, what can't we have the drapes equivalent on the Internet? That's right. Well, unfortunately, even having drapes in your house now, Rebecca, is not going to prevent the NSA or any other government agency from watching you walk around your house naked if they want to. You know, they have they have backdoors into all of your software. They can turn on the, the camera on your laptop if it's open and, and watch you walk around the house. Uh, it's a frightening world. So, Well, I, I, I will tell you what's more frightening is that anybody would want to look at a 60-year-old woman walking around her house naked. That's frightening. <laughs> Well, let's get to the heart of the matter here. I feel sorry for him, and actually, I should open my drapes, you know, be, be, so they should see where they're all headed. <laughs> oh, amazing! I, I know. So, l- listen, there there are all kinds of rumors floating about where you're going to start this new venture. Now, I, I I made a bet. I you know I'm I'm completely upfront on this radio program, and uh, there were some rumors that you were looking at Vietnam and other. I, I you know I can't believe anything I I hear, uh, but I got a bet. That you're going to do this in Silicon Valley. And here's my reason why. Because you still have a lot of fans and a lot of contacts there. And second of all, there is a wealth of scientists and engineers and venture money. And pretty much all the ingredients needed for a quick liftoff. Okay, well, you know, you're extremely close. We're actually going to do it in Silicon Beach, right across from Silicon Valley in Santa Cruz. No kidding. Well, yeah, absolutely. Because those, those... Those talents and assets that live in Silicon Valley don't mind commuting over the hill because it's the reverse commute, um, and and it's a nice environment to work in. I think it's it's less hectic, there's less traffic, um, the air is cleaner, and I like the ocean. So, uh, in fact, we're we're planning on doing something at least to start with a little bit unique. I'm I'm trying to find a uh, a couple of very old mansions close together with yards. Uh, that we can convert into, you know, office slash temporary living space. Uh, because especially with startups, you if, if you're not working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, you're not going to be very competitive. I got I got two words for you. What's that? Scotts Valley. Scotts Valley, beautiful place. No beautiful question. place, and there are campuses there with a lot of privacy, and uh, and it's there, right there, there off of Highway 17. I, I it, think it that's is. a that's a great place to go. Uh, you know, and and believe me, you'll have people flooding over from Silicon Valley to get out of that commute, and also for the opportunity to raise their families on the ocean. Who doesn't want to do that? I, I agree fully. In fact, I, when I had Tribal Voice, I had a satellite campus in Scotts Valley, and everybody wanted to go there. So, of course. Well, this is the good news. You're not planning to start this business in another country. No, of course not. Uh, number one, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah. Uh, um, and number two, I couldn't possibly be competitive. Well, wait a minute. You you you, you had to learn a lesson about f- other countries, right? Uh, you, I, you you learned I, that I, lesson. You're not going to do that again. You're not going to leave the United States. Say you won't. Well, of course I won't. I, I and I have <laughs> learned my lesson. You know, I I thought I was being smart by by building an antibiotic company in the jungles of police, but but all they do is wait around to to see if you're going to be successful and steal it from you. Or if they get bored, they, they steal what you have beforehand. They go, well, why should we wait for the company to be successful? He's got tons of money. Let's just take it now. Um, so no, you, you, can't, you can't be successful at high-tech companies uh, in, in any, any other country other than your own. And for me, that's America. Well, we know what happened to you in Belize, and we know that you were being blackmailed before any of this uh, stuff with the law came down. That's a pro- that's a different program, and I'm not going to go there. But I do want to uh, go to where you were developing a natural antibiotic based on anti-quorum sensing. Uh, what happened to that company? Because you were doing that out of Belize, right? I, I was doing out of Belize. Uh, here's the problem. I, I've I chose to uh, build the lab in the jungle on the banks of a river where I could access those plants that I needed for analysis. Right. It makes makes perfect sense. The problem is trying to get talent to live in that environment with no TV, no Internet, no air conditioning. Um, you you know, couldn't find any hermits that wanted to join you? 
Well, you know, it was very, very hard. And, and unfortunately, the, the type of talent that I needed were, were very, very high up the scale. Uh, a lot of Chinese people, for example, you know, try to get someone from China to come to, to a lab on a jungle river where there are mosquitoes and crocodiles and, and, uh, and howler monkeys. Uh, well, that's a difficult thing to do. Now, you should have put out an ad for biologists. They all like living in tents with mosquitoes and monkeys. Yeah, th- that's true. Unfortunately, the, the biologists that I needed, they were, they were very few and very far between. And most of them were researchers in academic institutions where they had tremendous benefits including very, very uh, short working hours uh, and, and a comfortable environment. Yeah, well, um, that's not going to happen in a startup, as we know. No, uh, so what, what happened to the company? What's the status of the company now? Well, you know, I, I, I simply I, I, I tr- uh, unwound the entire thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, I tried after the raid to keep it going, but it was just impossible. And I just totally unwound it. It was a tragedy because someone will do what I did and probably be one of the, unfortunately, one of the massive drug companies from Germany or someplace and make a huge success, but they will do it because they have the military backing of their own government to make sure that what happened to me does not happen to them. That's right. And anti-quorum antibiotics are really going to uh, be important to us as people start to encounter the resistances that they've developed. Absolutely. The nice thing with quorum sensing is is you do not get that resistance strain. That's right. uh, Because you're not actually killing the bacteria, you're just making them all deaf. So the the ones that are immune, do you know, they have no competitive advantage. That's right. And uh, and so it really is the answer to uh, the problems that we've created with all these antibiotics and the fact that we're giving them to kids at such a young age. We have to take our last break. Uh, We'll be right back with John McAfee after these brief messages. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. Fifty years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. But something you may not know is that Dr. King was represented by the world's foremost speaking agency, the American Program Bureau. The American Program Bureau has a courageous history of representing luminaries, entertainers, and motivators from all backgrounds. From Ronald Reagan, Richard Branson, and Mikhail Gorbachev to John Stewart, Michael Douglas, and Desmond Tutu. From A-list celebrities to best-selling authors, cutting-edge business leaders, and the greatest minds in academia... The American Program Bureau has speakers to fit every venue and every budget. When corporations, conferences, schools, and community organizations need an expert speaker, they turn to the American Program Bureau to help them craft an event that will be remembered long afterwards. To inquire about a speaker for your next engagement, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or visit our website at apbspeakers.com. The American Program Bureau, making history one speech at a time. A few years ago, I noticed I was feeling increasingly tired. My fatigue was so intense that I got to the point sometimes when I got home from work, I couldn't even remember the drive. The excessive tiredness and forgetfulness, not to mention my snoring that constantly woke up my husband, prompted me to get a sleep test. The results showed that I have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a common disorder. In fact, 50 to 60% of those who snore have it. Many couples accept snoring as an inevitable part of nightly life, but sleep apnea is associated with serious health problems, such as the risk of high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, and even heart failure. Treatments for sleep apnea range from simple lifestyle changes to breathing machines to surgery. Treating my sleep apnea has changed my life. 
Armed with information, you too could be on your way to a restful night's sleep and a healthier life. Learn more at wakeuptosleep.org or call 877-389-8868. There's just one place where students are students first and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. There's just one place where a team is more than a group of individual agendas. It's a catalyst for demonstrating the potential of the collaborative spirit. There's just one place where players, coaches, and fans experience the exhilaration that happens when an entire community rallies behind the school team. That place is your local high school. High school sports offer more than the joy of competition. Studies show that student athletes are more likely to enjoy greater levels of achievement in other areas of their lives, including academics. In addition, high school sports help young people in California develop the discipline and confidence they need to be leaders in life, even as they unite communities like nothing else. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. If you missed any of today's interview, catch the entire episode on www.rebeccacosta.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is John McAfee. And you were talking about the next big thing in ensuring that our communications are private and the fact that you're looking at Santa Cruz, California as a possible site for your headquarters. So, uh, let me let me ask you something. I, I recently had an opportunity to speak with uh, Carly Fiorina, the former CEO of Hewlett Packard, and and she was worried that you know we have fewer new businesses starting up and more small businesses failing than at any other time during the past forty years. So you know I imagine that uh, that's got to be something on your mind right now. Even, even with all the support and everything, this is a different time when you and I were working for startups. You know, that was the thing. Everybody was being funded and everybody was going all out. But we've got a lot of failures right now. And and she was talking about the fact that we've made it so hard for new businesses to get lift off. So is there anything that you think we can do to encourage innovation again and get folks like you back into the fray? Well, I mean, there, there are lots of ways to make it easier for small businesses to survive. I mean, there are tax incentives, there are uh, and any number of things, but I think I think the biggest problem is that the large companies. Uh, let, let's look at Google. Google is getting into so many new areas that uh, it, it's hard to find an area that they do not have an interest in. So uh, I, I think for a company to be successful now, you have to start looking at the strategy that uh, uh, the companies had when when uh, companies like IBM and Univac were. Or the powerhouses, you have to be small and quick. Um, and and if you realize that and work hard and uh, uh, move rapidly, it doesn't matter who your competitors are; you will outcompete them. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. The 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 environment for uh, financing for for any number of things. And well, the, the regulations, it, the laws, the, the fees, the licenses. The I mean, it goes uh, on and on. Of course. And, and that's just a result of a, of a uh, uh, advancing society that, that's reaching uh, the level of decay again. I mean, if you, you look at it in all uh, the societies in the history, they, they reach a certain level where we have to be so safe and so secure and make the environment so perfect that starting a new one just can't, just can't happen. But, but I think, I, I, you know, I, I, have, I have hope for people. I have, certainly have hope for my own product and my own company. And, and I think that we will succeed and, and we'll manage to, uh, to dance around all the things that we have to dance around. And if worst comes to worst, Rebecca, then, you know, companies will start relocating outside of them, not just outside of Silicon Valley, but outside of America. Well, they they've can. already started doing that. I know, and that's and that is a tragedy. And they don't do that simply because they're anti-American. Uh, they do it because uh, it's a necessity in some cases. There's no other way to be competitive. Uh, I, I think that you know, with my, I am 68 years old after all, and I have a little bit of experience. Uh, I think I can make this work. I think you can too. And not only that, uh, you are young at heart and always have been. Here's the thing: I, I worry about sometimes about the smaller companies. They're almost turning into incubation companies or feeders to the giants like Google and Johnson & Johnson and Facebook. 
You know, they get yep. up to a certain point, and these guys are so cash rich, they come in, and we're it's it's almost like losing the middle class of business. You know what I mean? Yep. There's the very yep. wealthy that come in and buy the smaller companies, and then you don't get the opportunity to see these companies grow. Well, here's the other issue. You, you, it takes two to tango. Uh, it doesn't matter how, how cash rich you are. Uh, uh, you can't be scooped up if you don't want to be scooped up. This is a fact. I mean, when I started McAfee, the first thing that, that happened was Gordon Eubanks, who was at, the, at that time the, uh, the COO of, uh, of Norton, uh, came over and said, hey, I'm going to offer you an outrageously large sum of money for your company, far more than it was worth. And I, I just said thank you, Gordon, and showed him the door uh, because I wanted to do my own thing. For a while, um, and then you did. You did uh, and- sell. Well, yeah, but I didn't really sell. I, I did my own thing and, and took it public. That doesn't that doesn't turn control over to a Google or a Norton or anything else. No, but it's it's, it's turning still, the control over to smaller sharehold, lots of smaller shareholders, right? Well, that that is entirely true. That is entirely true. Right, but, uh, but, but the fact is, eventually, you got your senses about you, and you yeah. said, "I want to live my life." Yes. I, I want to go somewhere where I can look at the beach, pet my dogs, uh, you know, do what I want to do and think the thoughts I want to think. Absolutely, which I think is every person's right and every person's need. You know, we, we have to be our own person. We have to be individual, um, and which gets right back to the fact that without privacy, we cannot be individualistic. You know, that's so true, and I don't think anyone's really thinking about the connection between your uh, self-esteem, your self-efficacy, and the, and the invasion of privacy. I've never heard anyone talk about it. Have you? If you think, if, well, I, I've talked about it. I, I, certainly it seems obvious if you think about it for a moment because it, the privacy gives us the protection against the the weaknesses of the human psyche, the protection against greed and, and jealousies and, and all of the things. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not advocating anything in terms of, of uh, uh, relationship between husbands and wives or lovers or what have you, but can you imagine what the world would be if every indiscretion of every human being were public? Well, we would have madness and chaos. Well, we would have that. madness, and not only that, what about the people who feel so judged already? I mean, look how long it's taken us to accept gay marriage or gay couples. Of course. And, and of the course. fact that these people have been living under fear for so many years. Yes. Uh, you know, this is, this is an example, right, of, of what happens when you allow people to make the choice. You know, at the end of the day, people have to make a choice. Now, you're not going to believe this, John. This is the fastest hour I've ever had on radio. And we are we are out of time. uh, But I I don't want to let you go without asking you to give your website address and any social media information so people can stay in touch. Well, I think I think the the primary address would be who is McAfee dot com. Uh, That is my that is my blog. And certainly everything that happens in my life ends up on that blog. Uh, and then you could be linked to other things from there. So, again, it's whoismcafee.com. That's great. And always great to speak to you. And, you know, I only live a little south of Santa Cruz, California. So when you're up here, I happen to know a couple of great sites for you that you might want to think about in that new company. So you give me a call, and I'll come down the airport and pick you up. I guarantee I will do that, I promise. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks for taking the time to join us. If right. your station Thanks, is leaving us after this hour uh, I'd l- and you'd like to comment on today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or send me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're all over the Internet, so uh, drop me a line and let me know what you thought about our conversation with John McAfee today. And if you missed the full interview with McAfee or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and also our new YouTube channel. And please, while you're there, take a moment to link it to your friends because that's how the truth goes viral. It happens one link at a time. I also want to thank listeners who continue to push the Watchman's Rattle to the top of Amazon book sales. And for those of you who have ordered an autographed copy from our website at RebeccaCosta.com. And here's an early reminder. If you're looking for something that isn't going to cost you an arm and a leg this year and is customized for someone that you love, A book dedicated specially to them is one of the most thoughtful gifts that you can give. And think of how good you'll feel knowing that that all those book proceeds are going toward keeping 
programs like the Costa Report on the air and available for over 3 million listeners. Thanks to you, they can enjoy this program each and every week. So do your part right now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com and get your book right now. Well, I have a final note here, and you'll be thrilled about this. Our producers have done it again. I don't know how they do it, but my guest next week is none other than former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, and he has got a lot to say about the government shutdown, our growing deficit, and what exactly is wrong with health care in America. I'd, I want you to make sure that you make a note on your calendar and you tune in because you don't want to miss what Tom Daschle has to say. And and I know that some of you are sitting there and you're saying to yourselves, eh, you know, Daschle's going to be partisan. He's going to take up the side of one or the other. And, and, uh, and, and you know, this is a program I don't need to listen to because I already know his position. Well, no, you don't. You do not know his position, and I will tell you why. Because this is one of the last programs where you have one full hour to listen to what someone has to say. So you tune into the Costa Report, the one and only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. And now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report, when we're going to hear what you have to say about our conversation with John McAfee. And just before I close this hour, I just want to say, John, if you're still listening, thanks so much for tuning in and for taking the time to speak to our audience today. We really appreciate it. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. There's just one place where students are students first, and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. There's just one place where a team is more than a group of individual agendas. It's a catalyst for demonstrating the potential of the collaborative spirit. There's just one place where players, coaches, and fans experience the exhilaration that happens when an entire community rallies behind the school team. That place is your local high school. High school sports offer more than the joy of competition. Studies show that student-athletes are more likely to enjoy greater levels of achievement in other areas of their lives, including academics. In addition, high school sports help young people in California develop the discipline and confidence they need to be leaders in life, even as they unite communities like nothing else. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome back to the second hour of the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and during the first hour, we had an opportunity to visit with former pioneer in antivirus software, John McAfee. And I know I'm going to hear from a lot of listeners who were probably hoping that I was going to spend the entire hour talking about the murder of McAfee's neighbor in Belize, 
or his disguises and escape to Guatemala or the alleged medical emergency that landed him back in the United States. And, and, and I know we've got a fascination with these kinds of stories, and that's the reason the media keeps parading McAvee around like some spectacle at a freak show and exploiting his fame to boost their ratings. And, and I want to tell you something, folks. That is what people have to do when they have no substance, when they're just talking heads and they've got nothing of any significance to contribute to the mainstream dialogue or our collective consciousness. They they grab on to the celebrity du jour and they exploit the most hair-raising story that they can. And, And let me just say that if you're a regular listener of this program, that is not the reason you listen. You listen because you expect us not to exploit a person like McAfee, not to sink to the level of the mainstream media, and not to go over the same old, same old, same old over and over again to satisfy some need for drama that we have. Um, but, But you expect us instead to make some earnest and respectful and genuine effort to get at the truth and advance the conversation. So when you tune into this program... That is what you are going to get. And, and if you want soap opera journalism, then I'm going to suggest to you that there are any number of programs for you to choose from. That, that is not what you're going to get here, and you're never going to get that here. And it doesn't matter if we're talking to a controversial guest like John McAfee or former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, who's going to be on this program next week with us, uh, to talk about the government shutdown and what we're going to do about health care. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a standoff, folks. I mean, this is the high art of blackmail that we're watching. And, uh, and we're all going to be affected by it. I know today we all got in our cars and went to work and nothing happened. But I, I'm saying that there will be a price to be paid. Because every day the government is shut down, uh, you know, the, the deficit continues to go up. Uh, now, for the record, I, I want to clear up a few things. Mr. McAfee has not been charged with murder. The government of Belize has stated that he is a person of interest, and McAfee has stated that he's more than happy to cooperate, but he'd like to do it by Skype or by telephone from a place that is safe. I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. And and that's that. They're also at a standoff, and, and there is nothing more to that story. Uh, more importantly, it's obvious that McAfee has bigger fish to fry. Uh, he, he's got his eye on a much bigger prize. He is an inventor. It is in his DNA. And if you've ever known an inventor, you you can't stop them. Uh, even when you take them on vacation and they're sitting looking at the beautiful ocean and drinking uh, fruit drinks with umbrellas in them, they're thinking. Their mind is always going. It's a busy place. They're fueled by a natural curiosity of the world and a desire a burning desire to solve problems. My, my brother's one of those people, as a matter of fact. He worked in research and development for Ford Aerospace, Fairchild, and Lamb Research before he ventured off to start his own company. But I can tell you that he was inventing when both of us were kids. Uh, one summer, he invented a tuna fish can squisher. Uh, uh, you're, you're shaking your head, going, really? That's what we're going to talk about? Yeah, we're going to talk about it. I hope he's listening. Uh, he didn't like the smelly juice that gets on your hands when you open a can of tuna. So we built a can opener that put pressure on the open lid and allowed the juice to drain out. And, and of course, he was a kid, so this invention was clumsy and it, it, it weighed a thousand pounds. But the but the point is, he was always fixing things and tearing our toasters and lawnmowers apart. And and from those beginnings as a child emerged a brilliant inventor Uh, today he operates an off-road vehicle safety equipment company called factor 55 and look i'm his older sister so i have had the great pleasure of watching him grow into the business person that he is today Uh, but but as his company grows and it becomes more successful and it begins to show up on the radar of large automobile accessory companies it's likely that he's going to travel down a similar path as McAfee. And his success is going to probably lead to some kind of a buyout. And when that happens, there'll be plenty of people to line up to exploit him too. I mean, when we live in a predatory world. And in that predatory world, money often brings out the worst in people. And I know I'm not telling you anything that you haven't seen before. I, I'm no idealist. Don't get me wrong. I, I understand everyone wants to leverage and profit from inventions. 
and from inventors. And, and I understand the media wants to get in on the action by profiting off of fame and celebrity. There's whole shows dedicated to that. But you know, at, at some point, we have to get on with it. We really do. And, and believe me, underneath all those jaw-dropping videos of McAfee that you see on YouTube and these redundant interviews about what happened in Belize, McAfee is a brilliant inventor. He's a quick mind. And he is a person who has jumped on every single opportunity that's presented itself and made the most of it. And we're going to see that happen again. We're going to see it happen in Santa Cruz, California. And some of you are hearing this for the first time, but I would say if you if you are an entrepreneur out there, if you're somebody that wants to work 24-7, if you're looking for that that spirit that you had in the 1980s and 90s in Silicon Valley where you could make the impossible happen, then you probably want to drop Mr. McAfee a line at his website. I think that'd be a really good idea. Show him you want to get a jump on what's going on. I didn't realize I was even going to be talking about this, but but you know what? Now that I think about it, any young person who's looking for an opportunity to do something great, be part of something great, and doesn't care if they have to sleep at their desk. This is the this is opportunity calling. Recognize it for what it is and go after it. And you are going to see McAfee do what he did all over again. What I, what he did in the in the antivirus software world. You're going to see it happen all over again because you can't stop someone like that. And you're going to see venture people and people with deep pockets line up to ride that ride again. So mark my words, you're going to see it start to happen and it's going to be a tremendous, it's going to have a tremendous impact on the Santa Cruz uh, economy. I would not be surprised in the next few years if McAfee doesn't turn out to be the largest employer in Santa Cruz County. You will see this happen. And he will make a a, a, a huge impact. And why do I say that? Because all true innovators do. All true innovators create jobs. They may not be able to hang on to their companies. They may be made a spectacle. They may be misunderstood. They may be judged. But I will tell you that innovation leads to jobs. Innovation leads to leadership. Innovation leads to competitive edge. And that is something that we ought to treat sacredly in this country. And I think we kind of got away from that. So today our focus was on where McAfee was headed. Uh, and, And you know by now, there's a book and a movie in the works. And now you know that he's going to focus his next attention on privacy. And I think all of us listening today know that privacy is a big issue. The Internet's become the Wild West, and we now have without, you know, look, I'm not trying to be hysterical here, but we can all agree there's warrantless surveillance going on. I don't care if it's metatag data, right? It could be metadata. doesn't matter. What I'm looking for, and I said this in the first hour, is I don't parade around my house at night without my drapes closed. I'd like the drapes equivalent of the Internet. You know what I'm saying? I'm not doing anything behind those drapes that you shouldn't see, but I'm just not comfortable with people looking in, maybe. And maybe you feel that way, too. All right, we're going to have to take a short commercial break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. 
The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Many of us have four-legged companions who are loving members of our family. As we age, we're increasingly concerned about who will care for our pets if they outlive us. It's shocking to discover that over three million pets are put down every year because there's no one to care for them. Hello, my name is John Lawton. I'm an elder law attorney and have been helping families like yours plan for your pet's care after you are gone. There are legal ways to do this, but unfortunately they aren't widely known. I see cases every day where families could have protected their pets and didn't. So don't wait. Call me at 831-649-1122 or visit my website at estateplan-lawyers.com. That number again is 831-649-1122. You can protect your pets as a seamless part of your estate plan. Make that call today. A few years ago, I noticed I was feeling increasingly tired. My fatigue was so intense that I got to the point sometimes when I got home from work, I couldn't even remember the drive. The excessive tiredness and forgetfulness, not to mention my snoring, that constantly woke up my husband prompted me to get a sleep test. The results showed that I have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a common disorder. In fact, 50 to 60% of those who snore have it. Many couples accept snoring as an inevitable part of nightly life, but sleep apnea is associated with serious health problems, such as the risk of high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, and even heart failure. Treatments for sleep apnea range from simple lifestyle changes to breathing machines to surgery. Treating my sleep apnea has changed my life. Armed with information, you too could be on your way to a restful night's sleep and a healthier life. Learn more at wakeuptosleep.org or call 877-389-8868. There's just one place where students are students first and athletics are played with purpose and perspective. There's just one place where a team is more than a group of individual agendas. It's a catalyst for demonstrating the potential of the collaborative spirit. There's just one place where players, coaches, and fans experience the exhilaration that happens when an entire community rallies behind the school team. That place is your local high school. High school sports offer more than the joy of competition. Studies show that student athletes are more likely to enjoy greater levels of achievement in other areas of their lives, including academics. In addition, high school sports help young people in California develop the discipline and confidence they need to be leaders in life, even as they unite communities like nothing else. High school sports, a winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. If you missed any of today's interview, catch the entire episode on www.rebeccacosta.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking about our conversation with John McAfee during the first hour. And uh, in the break, our co-producer, Linda Gully, she was waving her hands and said, you you had a question for me that came up over uh, social media? Yeah, okay. So this one just came in over Facebook, and you're going to like it. I am. That that usually means I'm not going to like it, but all right, go ahead. What was it like working with McAfee in the 80s? Oh, I don't know if I can go there. (laughs) Uh, well, all right. First of all, I will go there, right, because it was asked, uh, and I promised I'd ask any question, even the ones I don't want to. But uh, all right. Uh, we worked for a company called Omex Corporation. You can look it up. It was the first optical storage company, and it was also known as the oldest startup in Silicon Valley. John and I went there for the same reason. We didn't know each other. We met at o- Omex, but uh, we went there for the same reason. It had about two years, two to three years of venture funding left after which it was going to be kaput, and it had already been around for 10 years. So the fact is there was no downside to going there. Uh, If we went there and we turned it around, we could go, we could write our ticket anywhere. 
if we went there and it didn't do well, well, it had done terribly for 10 years. Nobody was going to blame us or fault us for that. So we found ourselves dealing with this incredibly complex technology uh, that, uh, and I, I'm, I know I'm going to pay for this. We wound up selling to the government primarily as our main customer because in those days there was no way to archive digital data. Archiving means preserve forever and ever and ever, and, and uh, there was no way to do it. Paper is not archiving. Paper will deteriorate. But instead of using a, a spinning disc, which is which turned out to win, it was very difficult to get the disc to align at, at the densities that people were looking at. So we figured, why do that? Why have anything spinning? Spinning is hard to control. Let's just use an XY coordinate system. So we had these uh, square glass uh, pieces that had tellurium in the middle of them. And I'm going to get a little technical here. And what would happen is, in order to show the the uh, you know the ons and offs of the digital world, you would just basically heat up a little spot of tellurium. And, and the tellurium, when it heated up, it would separate and it would create a hole. And that would be the ons and offs, right, for, for digital data. All right, I'm not going to get too technical. There's a bunch of people that are going, all right, I'm driving off the road, falling asleep here. But, but the, the fact is, is that John and I worked very well together. And uh, later, and I mean this year, come to find out I'm reading a Wired Magazine article, and you guys can pull it up on the Internet. And he starts talking about how he was just doing cocaine, massive amounts of cocaine every day and dealing it out of the back of this company. And then in order to have meetings with all of us, he was uh, evening himself out with a couple of quaaludes. And in the afternoon, to keep himself from falling asleep, he'd, he'd have a couple of uh, glasses of scotch. And I am so square. I, I, I Really, I'm a science and technology wonk. I am so square that I didn't even notice. And you got to be pretty square not to notice somebody was that whacked out on alcohol and drugs. And I and I have to tell you, I didn't. But what I've come to appreciate as I've gotten older here and, and some time has passed is he was a brilliant engineer, even impaired. So imagine what he can do now. He's got the wisdom. He's got the patience. He's got the experience. And he's not a drug impaired. And uh, And I would say that is a horse everybody should bet on. Right. So uh, so you might not think I'd be a person that'd be a McAfee fan, but I but I have had the pleasure of working with him when he wasn't up to snuff. And I can tell you, I raced like hell to keep up with this fellow. So I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah. Well, that leads me into another question. Would you work with McAfee again? Uh, don't you have any easy questions? <laughs> you got to put your money where your mouth is. Now. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I would. I, I would work with him again. Uh, I think we're both uh, – we, we both have that entrepreneurial spirit, and we knew what it was like to work till 2 in the morning, and, and actually both of us still do that. Yeah. You know, some of his emails are coming out at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, and you know our places – you know, our office goes 24-7. Oh, absolutely. I mean, between books and speaking things and, and Internet TV and all the other things that we're doing, uh, you know, and, and we live in a 24-7 world. So, yes, I would. And, and simply because he's a hard worker. He has a hard work ethic. And I don't do well with people that are lazy. Mm-mm. That's just that one thing. You know, it, you could be the smartest person in the world, but if you're lazy. But what What is it we could talk about in our radio program? We say, uh, uh, keep it tight and keep it right. Like, we, we <laughs> you know, we, we, we want to we wanna really dial in on, we can't be perfect, but we want to be the guys that are as close to so, uh, yeah, so my answer would be, have to be yes. Okay. But what we have our, you know, he's got his own company and I've got mine, so. Yeah, but they're going to be close in Proxemix at this point. Uh, they they will, and, you know, maybe we'll put some kind of, uh, you know, coffee support group. Isn't that what they do in old age? They start meeting at, book, having a book club. We'll have the McAfee Costa Book Club Coffee Clutch. How's that? <laughs> That's perfect. Mm-hmm. You want one more question? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid. I'll give you an easy one. All right. Kind of easy. Okay. Uh, well, maybe not so much. Do you think McAfee's telling the truth about the situation in Belize, and is his life really in danger? Oh, that's a good one. I, I have no idea what happened in Belize. Uh, I have no reason to suspect uh, John McAfee is a violent person at, at all. Uh, but what do you really know about another person? I just worked with him, so I, you know, I, don't, I don't know about his personal character. Yeah. Uh, I know about his work ethic and, and what he produces. 
Um, but I will say I, I lived in a foreign country. Well, I lived in Japan for 15 years, and then I happened to live in Laos and Cambodia for a period of time during the Vietnam War. Very corrupt. Uh, and, you know, and I will tell you what kind of blatant corruption it was. Uh, every time my mom would drive us down to the morning market in Vintian, Laos, there was a police officer standing at the corner of an intersection, and he would pull my mom's car, car over, and my mom would hand him money, and he would let us go through. Uh, otherwise, we would be the family would be arrested. And this is how he just put the money in his pocket, and that's the way it was. And, and you know, I was a kid, and I didn't think much of it. Uh, I, I don't – these things, when you're a child, you don't know any different. So I didn't think much of it. And, you know, I, I, it wasn't until much later I thought, wow, that's pretty out there in the open, isn't it? And, and it was out there in the open. Uh, I think that if you get in trouble with the law or powerful people in government in any corrupt country, you got to get out. You don't try to work their legal system because there is no – under corruption, there's no legal system. And so I, th- I can completely understand that McAfee's situation is you get sideways with the law in a corrupt country. The first obligation you have is to remove yourself from that environment. So whatever he, con- crazy thing he had to do to get out there, I don't fault him for that. He got into Guatemala and he was under threat that Guatemala was going to send him back to Belize. And, and he's right. He'd be rotten in a jail while our embassy tried to figure out what to do. And I'm not so sure in the case of John McAfee, they'd have been all that eager to get him out. So uh, so he did the right thing. He saved his life. And that's your first obligation, right, to stay alive. Oh, yeah. So he did that. And then, you know, the he, he had some medical emergencies. All right, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I, I don't really care about that. But he did get back into the United States. He got himself in a safe situation. And then here's what I'm going to say. He did the right thing. He went back to the Belize government and said, Fully willing to cooperate. Let's do it on Skype or phones. And that's all you can ask anybody to do, is to cooperate in a safe environment. All right. Uh, I think that's it for the questions. Thank goodness. we got to take a break now. <laughs> lucky you. Uh, yeah, luck, lucky me is right. All right. We're going to take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Are you looking for ideas to create a more balanced meal plan? As one of the world's largest providers of fresh fruits and vegetables, Dole makes it easy to eat the right foods. From a wide variety of salad blends and all-natural salad kits to fresh-cut vegetables and a rainbow of your favorite fresh fruit, Dole delivers good nutrition naturally. But Dole goes beyond just offering healthy fruits and vegetables. Dole has their own nutrition institute that gives you the knowledge and tools you need to make smart choices about your nutrition and health. Visit www.dole.com for more information about the Dole Nutrition Institute. Be sure to sign up for their e-newsletter to receive delicious recipes, tips, and articles to help you make your meals the best they can be. Visit www.dole.com for more. Hello, I'm Ben Vereen. You probably know me for my singing, acting, and dancing on Broadway, television, and the big screen, but what you may not know about me is that I'm one of the 26 million Americans living with diabetes. My doctor diagnosed me four years ago. But now, with my blood sugar levels under control, I've been blessed to continue to do what I love to do, perform, and not let this disease, type 2 diabetes, hold me back. In fact, I've taken a stand for my diabetes. And I'm asking those of you with diabetes and those who love them to take this stand with me. Talk to your doctor today and visit StandForDiabetes.org to learn more. That's StandForDiabetes.org. A public service of taking control of your diabetes made possible with support from Santa Fe U.S. Remember, if you have diabetes, it doesn't have to hold you back. Victor Ray, this is Scorpion 23 traveling west on MSR Vernon. Four Victor 16 packs. Request MSR status over. Roger. Scorpion 23, all MSRs and AOR red past 24 hours. Three IEDs on MSR Vernon. <laughs> Bravo, 310-737, take the small artifier. Request QRF and 
In war, there will always be casualties. And for our wounded warriors, coming home can sometimes be a battle in itself. American troops who suffer traumatic injuries need the support of every American. Join us and send your message of support to our wounded warriors and their families at uso.org. The USO, until everyone comes home. He worked out early, practiced late, and studied well into the night. The next day, he did it all over again. She missed time hanging out and socializing with friends so she could make it on time to practices and games. He became a top student and a confident leader, even as he helped his team win back-to-back conference titles. She became a role model in her community, even as she led her team to an undefeated season. And when they finished playing high school sports, what did they do next? She graduated from college with honors and went to work for a successful company. He attended graduate school and became a difference maker in his community. Because that's what student athletes in California do. They use the skills they develop playing high school sports today to do even bigger things in life tomorrow. High school sports. A winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Take a moment to see Rebecca's video pick of the week. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Rebecca Costa YouTube channel. Welcome back to the Costa Report. We have Professor Stephen Wagner joining us from the acclaimed Monterey College of Law, and we're fortunate to have him offer us a legal perspective each week. Thanks for being with us, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. Now, I understand today's topic is the importance of knowing the laws in other states or countries and the dangers associated with just not being informed. Uh, We often hear stories about travelers who get caught up in criminal activity. So I'd imagine if you're accused in a foreign country, that raises a host of legal issues that most of us don't even think about. It sure can. And let me just start by saying that I didn't want to address the issue of travel advisories necessarily or support to give travel tips, so to speak. But Mm -hmm. I do often confront issues like this that involve the interplay between laws from different states and often different countries. And one thing that comes up that we've had discussions before about in a different context is the idea of knowledge of the law or ignorance of the law of a different country. And that's really a loser argument. So it's important to be apprised of the other country's laws before you set out to do business or pleasure, really. So if you're ignorant of a law, that is no protection. It's no excuse for violating it. Yeah, the only way that ignorance of the law could apply or actually really become a vibrant defense in some way is if the law itself is actually unclear. But usually laws go through some type of legislative process, and uh, ideally, the laws have been scrutinized. Of course, that's not always the case, and some procedures might actually not be followed, which places a traveler in potential jeopardy, for sure. So what kind of crimes are most common on foreign soil? I have to imagine that drug-related crimes have to be one of them, right? Yeah, they are. Uh, You know, the drug crimes are very common in terms of... uh, frequency, and there's an interplay between laws uh, that are connected to traveling or being caught while transporting drugs, which is actually very often a different issue than the laws that apply in or on foreign foreign soil. So the drug laws that are in place in foreign countries regarding possession or sales often uh, impact dramatically what can happen to a U.S. traveler in a foreign land. So that that's one category that's very very popular and complex. So what about people who are suspected of crimes like uh, so-called persons of interest, as in the case of John McAfee, for example? Are are these individuals at the mercy of foreign authorities? You know, what often happens there is there's two critical phases. The investigative phase, when information is actually being gleaned or uh, investigated by local agencies, And 
the procedural safeguards that are in place in or on a foreign uh, land Mm -hmm. must be followed. So, you know, you mentioned at the mercy. It's very often a very challenging and complex issue. But what happens if you're wrongfully accused on foreign soil? I mean, what what's your recourse? You know, one of the things that I think should be done uh, immediately, I'm not dispensing specific legal advice, that's my mini disclaimer, if I may, mm-hmm. um, is that the State Department or, you know, the U.S. Embassy should have a liaison representative to assist somebody that's accused of a crime and that representative would certainly uh, be called into action at the early phases if somebody was, let's say, for instance, uh, confined or arrested at uh, some point. So they can assist in helping the arrestee with contact with family members or perhaps get local counsel, which is really very often one of the things that has to be done. But one of the wild cards, as I'm sure you know, is room for frolic and corruption. Right. But, you know, when you get accused of a crime and it goes public, like uh, John McAfee in Belize, for example, I mean, it it is ruining your reputation. Right. And, you know, one of the things that comes up there is what is the recourse for somebody in, let's say, John McAfee's position? Right. Uh, it, It The law would probably provide certain immunities for agencies that were instrumental in investigating a certain crime. And I understand in the case of John McAfee, that involved the death of a neighbor. Is that right, Rebecca? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, uh, you know, any investigation that was conducted in connection with potential involvement by Mr. McAfee uh, would probably not subject the agency to so-called defamation or privacy-type causes of action. Mm Mm-hmm because there's usually immunities connected to that. I see. If the agency can legitimately claim that they're conducting professional investigations. Well, let's talk about McAfee for just a moment. He's a person of interest in connection with the murder in Belize, and he has offered to answer any questions the police in Belize have. But he wants to do it in a safe location, which means here in the United States. So he's offered telephone, Skype, even to meet with them here in the United States. Um, why can't they just do this? I mean, we do arraignments by video all the time these days. What's the issue with doing it that way? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, the comparison between an investigation and an arraignment. The arraignment comes procedurally after somebody's been formally charged. Right. In this case, to participate in an investigation over, let's say, uh, Skype technology, where there's a distance between the questioner and the target suspect, it compromises the ability of the agency to glean information because part of the investigation tactics would be to observe the person. Well, so, you can, but you're observing them on Skype. True, but you know, person-to-person contact, I think, is something that gives an investigative agency or an investigator a little bit better vantage point. So, well, those, let's weigh that against. Let's weigh the difference between Skype and person-to-person against locking someone in a room, not letting them go to the bathroom, not giving them water, and keeping them for 48 hours while you bully them. Right. Well, now now you're tripping the wire on the issue of constitutional tactics and whether or not due process rights have been violated. And the We've problem- all watched L.A. Law. I mean, we've all watched Law & Order, right? We, we've watched these, these programs where they, they come right up, where the investigators come right up to the line and hang their toes over it, but they don't cross it. Right. Well, they usually know their limits, uh, and I can't vouch for a lot of the theatrics on late-night TV shows, but, (laughs) (laughs) you know, even though you want to take me there, uh, but that's the tension for sure. I, I have to believe that if somebody doesn't feel safe, if their life has been jeopardized, if their home has been invaded... Uh, if they've been asked for bribes and refused, if they had to escape a country undercover, uh, that's kind of a grounds for saying, look, I don't mind cooperating. I'll tell you everything I know, but can I do it somewhere safe? Isn't there a legitimate case for that in your view? 
Yeah, there might be. I mean, in in McAfee's situation, he he uh, fled to Guatemala. Is that right? Yeah, fled to Guatemala, and then they were going to send him back to Belize because he came in illegally. But then he had a medical emergency. Okay, and that's what prompted his return to the United States. Allegedly, yes. Allegedly, okay. All right. Well, to the, use one of your legal terms. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Safety first, right, Rebecca? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are competing interests, and. Uh, they're always going to cause tension points. You know, the right of the accused to have proper procedures applied and the right of the agency to effectively investigate crimes on their soil. Well, the fact that he's willing to meet them here person to person in the United States, I think might blow a hole in the argument that they can't see him face to face. He just yeah. doesn't want to do it in Belize. So yeah, no, I think I gotta, right. I gotta believe that, you know, there's something look, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. They have a saying like that. It's in Latin in le- in the law, I think. Yeah. Right? Right. Race ipsa loquitur. There you go. So, you know, if you make all these offers and people don't take you up on it, uh, there's probably a problem there. That that is all the time we have, but uh, I will tell you one thing. With all the traveling I do, it is a miracle. I haven't run into some law I don't know about. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Stephen Wagner speaking to you from the Monterey College of Law, reminding you that when it comes to the law, a little knowledge is not a dangerous thing. All right, we're going to take a brief break uh, to hear from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. You're listening to The Costa Report. What does your website do for you? Does it simplify doing business and automate routine tasks? Does it connect with your target audience and bring new business? If you can't answer yes, then you need to contact Sunstar Media. Located on the Monterey Peninsula for over 17 years, Sunstar Media has developed websites for startups, brick-and-mortar stores, to corporations on the stock market. What makes Sunstar different is the customization that goes into every site, tailored to each client's unique needs and vision. Sunstar's experienced pros keep you ahead of the game with their custom-fit development process for website applications that cater to your company's specific needs. Learn more at sunstarmedia.com. Mention you heard this ad on the Rebecca Costa Show and get a free web analysis report on your current site or a free web consultation for your next project. Let's discuss how Sunstar can help you. Reach out to us at sunstarmedia.com. Now, here's something to think about. If we're having the same problems in the United States that every other country is struggling with, then are these problems really domestic issues? At what point do we wake up and say, hey, if it's happening to everyone, it means it's happening to our species? That's why I'm asking you to read The Watchman's Rattle, because when you do, you'll see that the very idea that there are domestic and international threats is a myth. All of the problems we face today, problems like unemployment, debt, climate change, terrorism, nuclear proliferation, even the spread of pandemic viruses involve other nations. So please take a moment to pick up the Watchman's Rattle. It's a perspective you'll not find anywhere else, and it offers us solutions you won't find anywhere else. Get the Watchman's Rattle. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. I used to dread getting up and going to work. I was done with the corporate grind. I was tired of being a starving artist. And I started looking around for a business that I believed in, and I kind of wanted to do something a little more green. My score mentor helped me take the first step. He helped me create a business plan and helped me implement it. They really taught me how to think big. SCORE helped me to make the unimaginable possible all for free. I'm here because of SCORE. I'm here because of SCORE. Get your free business mentor at SCORE.org. The 1,200,000 women and men of Rotary have accomplished extraordinary things. They've taught people to read, worked toward world peace, and have nearly eradicated a crippling disease. But each of them know they could accomplish so much more if only they were 1,200,000 and one. Learn more at rotary.org. He worked out early, practiced late, and studied well into the night. The next day, he did it all over again. 
She missed time hanging out and socializing with friends so she could make it on time to practices and games. He became a top student and a confident leader, even as he helped his team win back-to-back -back conference titles. She became a role model in her community, even as she led her team to an undefeated season. And when they finished playing high school sports, what did they do next? She graduated from college with honors and went to work for a successful company. He attended graduate school and became a difference maker in his community. Because that's what student athletes in California do. They use the skills they develop playing high school sports today to do even bigger things in life tomorrow. High school sports. A winning part of a complete education. This message presented by the California Interscholastic Federation and the California State Athletic Directors Association. Grab your smartphone and follow us on Twitter. Twitter.com forward slash Rebecca Costa. Welcome back to the Costa Report. And now we come to the to everybody's favorite secret addiction, what's new in the wonderful world of technology. And here to tell us is Luis Alvarez, the CEO of Alvarez Technology Group. Hi, Luis. Thanks for joining us again. Oh, I, it is my pleasure, Rebecca. Let me tell you, every time I feel down, I come on your show and my ego just gets boosted. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> well, happy to provide a drug-free <laughs> boost. <laughs> so, thank so you, you know... Uh, with all that uh, governments are doing right now to crack down on uh, street and white collar crime around the world, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, the biggest threat seems to be in cyberspace. And, and we don't hear that much about cracking down on Internet hackers and criminals who cross country lines and are wreaking absolute havoc right now. Well, you're right. It, it's a really complicated landscape. But, you know, that's starting to change um, uh, for the good. For example, a couple of weeks ago, the FBI shut down a cyberspace black market site with the really cool name of Silk Road. Think of it as the Amazon.com for illegal products, uh, everything from crack cocaine to hacker tools like viruses and Trojan spyware. You can even get counterfeit money. If, no you know, for, counterfeit yeah. money. Yeah. For 25 bucks, you can buy a $100 counterfeit bill. Um, and, you, and, you know, you could get falsified documents. $2,000 gets you a U.S. passport, and $10,000 would get you um, full U.S. citizenship papers. Uh, so, you know, the Silk Road was considered to be the largest, most profitable of the numerous black market sites that exist in cyberspace. And they made up to, you know, some of the, the feds say it's like over a billion, 1.2 billion, somewhere in there. Oh, boy. Boy, you talk about a security problem. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, and and you say it's just one of many sites. I mean, how were people paying for these black market products? I mean, they weren't using credit cards that were traceable, were they? No, that's the interesting part because you're right. You know, credit card transactions, even you know, you know banking transactions are, are traceable. Um, so what these guys do is they use a, a, a currency, a cyber currency called Bitcoin that was invented specifically to be used in cyberspace for legal transactions, but these guys have managed to, to use it for illegal transactions. And, and Bitcoin is like a commodity. It's traded on public markets, so um, you, know, you can convert your Bitcoins to real money. Um, but the Bitcoins are very difficult to track. Wow. Well, well so who was behind us, Silk Road? The one that got well, busted. This got busted by by our own law enforcement. Is that right? Yeah, the, the FBI working in conjunction with uh, some uh, internet or you know international agencies. Uh, Silk Road was a creation of a guy named Ross William Ulbricht, mm -hmm. uh, who lives in San Francisco. He's a 29 year old um, American former physics and engineering student, and he publicly espoused a lot of free market libertarian economic ideals and, and railed against the government. Um, and by the way, quick side note. This guy has an eerie profile that, that matches guys like, you know, Julian Assange and, and Eric Snowden, which makes me wonder if, if we're getting a peek into a generational shift in thinking about markets and, and the government that could have some really scary consequences. Uh, um, yeah, like scary, young, lonely white guys. With uh, with the smarts to really cause some <laughs> yeah, who, who, who are up to no good. Uh, somebody get them a girlfriend. Yeah. Please. Well, you know, one of the intriguing things about Silk Road, though, is that it existed in a part of the Internet known as the dark web. 
right? I, I, you know how I love bringing this stuff to your attention. And it's you know how much <clears throat> I, I get, lose sleep. <laughs> well, the dark web is really a name given to part of the Internet that's hidden uh, from view from most people. And you can only access it using sophisticated tools and software that reveal its presence only if you know where to look. Okay, I'm going to bite. What the heck is a dark web? This is sounding like no place I want to go. Well, you know, it it works this way. Um, the the primary way of gaining access to the dark web and to sites like Silk Road that exist there is to use uh, software, um, something called Tor or the Onion Router. Really, that's his name. The I Onion and, Router. The Onion Router. I use the Onion <laughs> Router to get to the dark web. <laughs> Hey, uh, okay, cyber okay, guys are, okay are good this with is names. the middle of the afternoon. What bar are you at and where do we send the cab? <laughs> well, I can, I can get really <laughs> the, technical. The onion and go, router. It's a real thing, and I can get kind of geeky and tell you how it works, but just think of it as a secure, encrypted uh, series of cyber tunnels that are layered over the traditional Internet backbone. So, in essence, they exist in the same place that the Internet does, but nobody knows about it. It's kind of like, like if you lived in a suburban neighborhood with thousands of houses and, and hiding amongst the, the sedate cookie-cutter homes, there are you know dozens of meth labs operating, but only the, the bad guys know where the labs are. You mean exist. where I live? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, can go, I can rescue you from there. Right, right, okay. <laughs> So the, the dark web is, is a place where these sites all set up shop, and, and it's a, a place that, um, you know, uh, cyber, uh, um, you know, agencies that, that track criminals are just starting to tap into and just starting to look at, but they're getting smarter about it. And, then, you know, the fact that they took down uh, Mr. Ulbricht and Silk Road tells you that they're, that they're you know, paying attention and getting better at it. That's right. Well, now, now you say that the dark web's opened up a new way of doing business over the Internet. Is that right? That's correct. And, so, you know, the way it works is if you have the right tools, you know where to go. And, and in certain cases, the, you have to be invited to, to participate. You just can't show up and, and, uh, and uh, you know, start transacting business. So it's a very, you know, scary criminal world, but it's like any criminal enterprise. Um, you know, the bad guys will find it if it exists. Well, this is like the electronic version of the mafia. You know, you don't get to just <laughs> yeah. set up in the local neighborhood. We got territories. <laughs> yeah, and, and since you these know. guys all tend to use like you know, nom de plumes, if you will, you know, pseudonyms. Nobody says, "Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Ross Ulbricht. I'm here to do illegal stuff." Mm-hmm. They call themselves like uh, uh, Mr. Ulbricht. Uh, use the name the great uh, the dread uh, what do they call it? the dread uh, uh, pirate uh, something or other. What? So, you know, he the, called the himself character... a pirate. He called himself a pirate. Yeah, the, using the the name from the guy. What in, are these um... kids? <laughs> in certain <laughs> cases, they are. Yeah, they they you know they act like children. They they rail against authority and. Uh, this is uh... adolescence with too much power. I I am not comfortable with this. Well, you know, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think we need to find a way to, to address these issues, especially as, you know, this generation of young, very talented, very, you know, tech-savvy folks start to kind of um, stretch their, their, their legs, and, and we're going to need to find a way to, to deal with this kind of stuff, because before they, you know, they could throw temper tantrums on the street and nobody much cared, but now they're throwing temper tantrums and upsetting the economy, and, and we're going to have to figure a way well, out. Well, you know what my them. theory is? My theory is if you don't give them jobs, this is what they do. If you don't give kids things to do, then you can't complain when they do things you don't want them to do. You do have to find a way to engage with them. Absolutely You true. do. Absolutely. And this is what unemployment is going to give us. It's going to give people that will find employment doing mischief that, that we don't need. Well, you know what? Uh, this is just another offshoot of the Internet that's going to scare the pants off of me uh, tonight when I start thinking about it. So I think about the dark web and the onion that you get into the dark web. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I tell you, I love hearing from you, but... Boy, the more I hear, the more concerned I get, um, and I am concerned about cybercrime these days. That's all the time we have left, but thanks for coming by and giving us an update, Lewis. My pleasure. This is Lewis Alvarez of the Alvarez Technology Group reminding everyone that when it comes to technology, forewarned is forearmed. Well, that is our program this week, and as always, if you'd like to comment on our interview with Lewis or uh, – 
uh, Stephen Wagner, uh, John McAfee. Uh, you can email me at my website at RebeccaCosta.com. That's Rebecca Costa, my name, dot com. And you can also post your comments on our Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn pages. And if you missed the full interview with John McAfee or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes from Apple iTunes and Podbean, as well as our website and the Rebecca Costa YouTube channel. And uh, while you're at our website, I, I do hope you'll take a moment to pick up a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, uh, A Radical New Theory of Collapse. It's the only book that you're going to find that will spell out the three signs to watch out prior, watch for prior to a collapse. And you want to know what the first one is? Well, I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to give you a sneak preview. It's gridlock. That's the first sign. And I think we can all agree that we're well on our way to the second phase. Want to know what the second phase is? It's a confusion between empirical facts and unproven beliefs. And I think a lot of you will say that we just passed, that the train just left a station a little while ago. So find out what to look for. Do it right now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com and pick up the Watchman's Rattle. And uh, I'm going to tell you that my producers have done it again. I don't know how they get all of these spectacular guests. My hat is off to them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, my guest next week is none other than former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, and he's got a lot to say about the government shutdown, our growing deficit, and what's wrong with health care in America. So don't miss Tom Daschle next week right here on the Costa Report. Until then, I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for this edition of the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Hello, I'm Ben Vereen. You probably know me for my singing, acting, and dancing on Broadway, television, and the big screen, but what you may not know about me is that I'm one of the 26 million Americans living with diabetes. My doctor diagnosed me four years ago. But now, with my blood sugar levels under control, I've been blessed to continue to do what I love to do, perform, and not let this disease, type 2 diabetes, hold me back. In fact, I've taken a stand for my diabetes, and I'm asking those of you with diabetes and those who love them to take this stand with me. Talk to your doctor today, and visit StandForDiabetes.org to learn more. That's StandForDiabetes.org. A public service of taking control of your diabetes made possible with support from Santa Fe U.S. Remember, if you have diabetes, it doesn't have to hold you back.